Can you hear me? Good evening. Okay. I'm not a fiery preacher, so don't expect any fire and brimstone. But uh, God has a message for each one of us. Let us pray. Precious Father, as we open your word, open our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I want you to do three things throughout this week. Three things. Pray that you will never be the same again in your life. If you remain the same after this week, then something is wrong with your spirituality. Something God must do in your life that you will never be the same again. And you must be genuine in your prayers. You must pray, Lord, after this week, there must be some change in me. Change for good, change for life. Sometimes when we have a week of prayers like this, we have a high week, and then the next day we go down to the valley again. Year after year, time after time, this happens. But it's time that we wake up and be intentional in our Christian journey. Some of us are just surface Christians. We love to hear good sermons, we love to hear good singing, and nothing changes. Don't, let's not fool ourselves. That's why I said yesterday, some of us are going to hell via church. Because it's such a comfortable place to make you feel good. So first thing I want you to pray is that after this week, you will never be the same again. At least some change for good and for life. And number two, pray that God will touch at least one person during this week. Your prayers is important. Adventist church is blamed for not praying too much. Do you know that? We don't pray much. We talk so much, but we don't pray. So I want you to pray in your personal prayers. Lord, this week, not just touch me, touch someone else. Touch someone else that they may be changed for life and for good. Is that okay? And the third one is for your college, the Solis University, that this will be a little heaven upon this earth. All over the world, we hear so many stories about Solusi. We want to make sure this is blessed abundantly. How can God bless this university if you don't feel the need to pray for a blessing, isn't it? You may see so many things that you may not like. This is an, this, we are still on earth. Things may not be perfect, but your prayers can change things. Do not underestimate the power of prayer. It can move mountains. That's what Jesus said, isn't it? So it can sweep this college. And it, this is one of the pioneer Christian institutions in whole of Africa. You have a big burden to lift it up in prayers every morning and evening that God's mercy will prevail in this place. When the Holy Spirit descends here, it will never be the same again. We need to believe that. So please keep these three things in prayer that God will bless you. Do you know one of the frustrating things our experience in a life is to talk to someone and they don't talk to you back. No matter how much you talk, they just be quiet. I wish they say something, even if it is hurtful, then to be quiet, isn't it? You know, silence is a killer. It's a dangerous thing. This happens in relationships. When there is an argument between a wife and a husband, if one person is talking, the other person seems is quiet, what happens? Ladies, have you experienced that? Why can't you say something? Why are you quiet? Your silence is killing me. It happens among friends. You want to talk to the friend and make sure things are right and the friend doesn't respond. It hurts. Parents to children. Children, parents ask you, tell me what happened? Why are you sad? Leave me alone. Don't talk to me. Um, I think the kids here are better, but I'm talking about my, you know, British culture and experience. Too much independence. They don't want you to do anything. I wish you told me the reason why you're quiet than to be quiet. That's the kind of silence it is. In the same way, one of the greatest difficulties for human beings is to understand God's silence. Sometimes the silence of God can lead people to leave God and church. In my 24 years of ministry, I've seen 
people leave God and church and say, God is not there. How much I spoke to him, how much I prayed, nothing seems to happen. If he's really there, then why is he silent? If he's real, then why can't he show up when I needed him the most? If he's really powerful, then why is he silent and leave me alone to suffer? If he's all-knowing and he knows my situation, why is he blind and ignorant to my needs? Sometimes we go through these doubts in the journey of our lives, especially when we are going through some crisis and God seems to be silent. Your prayers sometimes do not seem to go over your roof. How many times you said, well, maybe God is not answering my prayer. Let me ask my friend or my pastor to pray. At least he will answer their prayers. Anybody thought like that? Yeah? Yeah. Sometimes when God seems to be quiet and silent, you wonder, maybe he is not interested in you. The more you pray sometimes, the harder the situation. And you wonder, why should I pray? I'm better off not praying. God seems to be far and quiet. What do you do at such times? How long should you wait? Has God abandoned you? Doesn't he care for you? How do you understand God's silence? Does God's silence mean that he left you alone to suffer and die? Does God's silence mean that he's absent? He doesn't care for you? All these questions in your journey as young people, some of us adults in our ministry, in our work, when we are asking God certain things and nothing seems to work out, we may go through this kind of questions in our own lives. I have gone through many a times and I've asked God, are you still there? Are you really there? If you're there, show up. Show me how long, how long. There's a beautiful story in the scriptures that really taught me that God may be silent, but he is not absent. It has encouraged me to trust God even in the midst of complete silence from God. And I felt I must share that with you so that when you feel God's silence in your life, you will know he may be silent, but he is not absent. And while he is silent, I want you to know he is doing something that you can't even imagine for yourself. Are you ready for this story? Joseph, beautiful story, very famous story. Joseph was a well-beloved child of all the sons. He was the most beloved of his father to show how much he loved him. What happened? He made him a beautiful coat of colors and gave him that instigated jealousy from his brothers that the father treats this little boy more closer than them. And you know, on top of that, Joseph had two dreams, isn't it? The dreams, if the dreams have nothing to do with parents and brothers, that should have been okay. But what does the dreams talk about? That he will be the head. That he will rule over his brothers and his parents. They will all bow down to him. You know, in our cultures, we don't accept that, isn't it? You may be well educated. You may be holding a big position. But when you come in front of your father, your mother, you need to show respect, isn't it? And if you tell them you have to bow down to me, you know, the Indian culture where I grew up and your culture, it's, I can see so many similarities. We need to respect our parents. We need to respect our elder siblings, elders in the church, people who are elder to us. We have to a certain way of respect for them, isn't it? So for a, for a, for a teenage boy to tell his parents and his brothers, this is the dream I have, he didn't even have to interpret. They understood it. So you're trying to tell us that we will all bow down to you? And the father was also upset. But who's, who gave him these dreams? Who gave him these dreams? Hello? I, I love responses. God himself. The question is now, how many years was God silent in the life of Joseph? Let's see. Genesis 37 verse 2 says, Joseph, how old was he? Help me out. It says he was 17 years old when feeding the flock with his brothers. In other words, when he took the food for his brothers, he was around 17 years old. That's when we know that his age. Genesis 41, 46, it says, Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before King Pharaoh. So how old? So 
from the time he left his father's place, he was 17, and when he was stood before the king, he was 30. How many years in between? Huh? Yeah, if you take out 17, it is 13, but because at the age of 17, he left, if you include 17, it's 14 years. It's 14 years of God's silence in his life. God showed him a dream. He told him, this is what you will be. And then God went, he left him. 14 years of quietness. In the judicial language, 14 years, what do you call it? If somebody was sent to prison for 14 years, what do you call that? Life? Life sentence. Is my accent okay? Are you able to understand? Okay. <laughs> or you want me to speak, is, preach in my language? In judicial language, in, in court languages, for, if somebody is sentenced for 14 years, it, it simply means life sentence. That's what. So it's almost like God showed him a dream. God said he would bless him, make him a leader. And for 14 years, there was no news from God. There was no message from God. Now, how, does, how, do, how uh, does Joseph handle this silence? I want to show you seven scenes. I will show you seven scenes from the life of Joseph where God was completely silent and yet he was not absent. Uh, uh, there's powerful lessons. Each of us will be encouraged from this. The first scene is Joseph's brothers and the plot to kill him. You know the story very well. As he was taking food for his brothers, from a far distance, the, the brothers saw him, maybe recognized him by the color coat, and then he says, here comes the dreamer. And the first thing they said is, as soon as he comes, what did they think to do to him? Shall we give him a hug and kiss him and say, welcome, my brother? The scripture says, let us now kill him. Verse 20. As soon as he comes here, we are doing what? Let us now kill him. And then cast him into some pit, and we shall say, some wild beast have devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. They want to kill his dreams. They want to kill him. They already planned. We'll kill him. We'll throw him in the pit. Everybody agreed. As he came closer, something happened. One of the brothers intervened. And he says what? Verse 21. But Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. Everybody it's decided to kill him. And then one says, let us not kill him. I want you to see how God is working out in his life, though he was silent. And then finally, everybody give in to the Reuben's advice and say, okay, let's not kill him. After all, he's our flesh and blood. And then they, they, will, they decided not to kill him. You think that was a coincidence? That they all decide to kill him and then decide not to kill him? God's hand was working out something. You, I want you to see God's providence. I want you to see God's hand, though God was silent and did not intervene in, in a spectacular way. So what was it? What, why did he say, let us not kill him? Because Reuben thought, if we don't kill him, I'll find a way to deliver him. So God was using Reuben here to do God's purposes. The second, Joseph was thrown in a pit. The scripture says, Genesis 37, 23 to 24. So it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. Then they took him and cast him in a pit. I want you to see God's hand here. They were standing or stay, they, were, they were in a place where there was a pit. And they said, okay, let's throw him in the pit. But look at the providence of God. What does the last part of the verse say? And the pit was empty and there was no water. You think it's a coincidence? You think it was an accident? It is God's providence. God was silent. God did not tell. Remember one thing. If God were to reveal his plan to you in advance, what would happen to you? You would not live. You would not face your life. Had God told Joseph, as you take food for your brothers, they try to kill you. They will put you in a pit. They will sell you to Egypt. What would Joseph do? He would not. If the Lord were to reveal to me, as you go to Zimbabwe, Solusi, 
you will never return back to England, what do you think I would do? What do you think I would do? I would call your VC and tell him, sir, can you find somebody else? I have a business to attend, I will tell you. <laughs> Why should I get killed coming to Solusi? I praise God that he doesn't reveal our future. Otherwise, we will not live. Just one thing, if God were to tell you at the age of this, in this place, in this way, you're going to die, what would happen to you? You would not sleep every night. If I were to reveal, Mohan, you're going to die in a car accident, I would not go in a car in my life. <laughs> Am I making sense? Praise God that he doesn't reveal things in advance because it is for our own advantage. We may, be, we may be going through difficulties, but God allows it for your own good, for my own good, to bring something out of it. Had God revealed to Joseph the events, he would never have taken the food in the first place. So here, the pit, you think there was no, pit was empty and there was no water. You think it was an accident or was it a coincidence? No, God was there preparing things. God did not deliver him from troubles but he was paying a way through the pain and suffering. So that's the second scene. You can see God was silent, did not tell Joseph anything, but he was working out something. The third scene, Joseph was sold to Midianite traitors. So what happened? The brothers sat, they threw him in the pit, they opened their food that he brought, so cruel, isn't it? You want to eat the food that he brought, but you don't want him. What kind of brothers they are? So they opened the package or whatever the bag of food he brought and they were about to eat. Scripture is so precise. Look at what the scripture says. Genesis 37, 25 to 28. What does it say? And as they sat down to eat their meal. They haven't even eaten, eaten yet. They just sat down. What did they see? What does the scripture say? Then they lifted their eyes and looked and behold, there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels. They are bearing spices, balms and myrrh. They were spice merchants coming, going to uh, Egypt to sell their merchandise. The scripture says, as they began, sat down to eat, they saw these merchants coming. Think it's an accident? You think it was a coincidence? What if these merchants have come before Joseph arrived there? What if these merchants have come after they have eaten food and left that place and gone? Look at the timing, God's timing. As they sat down to eat, that's when the merchants came. And then what does his brother say? Suddenly they get a thought. What's the point of killing him? Let's get some benefit out of him. Let's sell him so that we can get some money. You understand? Look how God is working. So as soon as they came, by the way, are these merchants slave masters? What does the scripture say? Scripture precisely says they sell spices. They're not slave masters. So these all the 11 brothers, the, the brothers stop them and say, look, we have a young boy. We want to sell him. Do you want to buy? The, slave, the, the merchant says, we don't slave, we don't buy slaves. We are not slave masters. We sell spices. If you want, we can sell you them. Not, no, no, no. You, whatever you give, we will take. But we want you to take him. They pressurize him. They, they force these merchants. Finally, they look at the boy. They pull him out of it. They look at him. He is very young and handsome and well built. Well, we don't need him, but let's take him. Maybe in the market in Egypt, we can sell him, get more. They say, well, we will only give you how much? How much? 20 shekels of silver. That money is not even worth to buy a lame slave, according to scholars. So they almost sold him for nothing. The brothers accepted this 20 silver coins and they said, okay, you take him, just take him. Look how from the dreams, how low, how much of low Joseph was going. Now they take him. That's the third scene. Look at the fourth scene. Joseph was sold to Potiphar. So these people take him, go to the market in, in Egypt. They went there to sell their merchandise, that is spices. Now in the market, they may also at this time have a slave trade. They put this boy for sale, Joseph. 
This is, this is an indication that they are not interested in this boy to buy in the first place, isn't it? If they wanted him, they would have kept for themselves. But as soon as they went to Egypt, they put him for sale. And look at the providence of God. Look at this verse. Genesis 37, 36. Now the Midianites had sold him Egypt to who? Potiphar. And it doesn't simply st stop with his name Potiphar. Look at, it also gives him his designation. He's an officer of Pharaoh and a captain of the guard. I want you to imagine this. That day morning, Potiphar got up. He's a, you know his story. Very rich man. So many servants. I don't know what made him think he needed one more servant. So he says to his wife and all, I'm going to the market. I want to bring, I want to buy another slave. The same day, at the same time when Joseph was put there for sale, he goes, among all the other slaves, his eyes fall on this boy. And then he looks at him and he says, I want this boy, I'll buy him. What if Potiphar came one hour late? What if Potiphar came one hour early to buy a slave? What if he chose not to buy and somebody else, a normal person like you and me, bought him? What would have been to the history? Look at the timing, how God was working out. God did not deliver Joseph at all these troubles. But you, and God never spoke to Joseph anything. Quiet. And yet, God seems to work out something for him. It was God's providence that at the same time when Joseph was standing on this bench to be sold, it was Potiphar that would go and buy him. I would expect God to release me, not sold me to slavery, but God has different plan. Uh, scene five. And the story continues. Because of his faithfulness, he gets into trouble. Have you got into trouble because of faithfulness? Have you got into trouble because you stood for the truth? If not, something is wrong with your religion and my religion. Look at Genesis 39, 20. Then Joseph's masters took him and put him in a prison. You know why, he, why they put him in prison, isn't it? So we'll not go that far. For the sin that he did not commit, he was thrown in the prison. But look at this. This is what amazes me. Look at the next part. A place where who? The king's prisoners were confined and he was there in the prison. That means there is a special prison for king's prisoners. Those who offend the king, they have a special prison. Joseph never offended a king. He was not a king's prisoner. He was the prisoner of the Potiphar, who is an officer of the king. I don't know what made Potiphar do this. He decided to put him in the most secure prison in Egypt for a crime that he never committed. He was not a murderer. He was not an adulterer. He was not a threat to anyone. And yet, they choose to put him in the most confined or secure prison in Egypt. That is where the king's prisoners will be kept. Very strange, isn't it? But it's not an accident. It's not a coincidence. God's providence. To put a boy who never did anything wrong in the most confined security prison, God is working out something. But all this while you see, his working is not, seems to do any good to Joseph, isn't it? From slavery, from brothers to Pete, Pete to slavery, and now to prison. Step by step, he seems to be going down. And yet, the Lord was doing something quietly. Now look at this, sixth scene. Joseph made in charge of king's prisoners. We know the story. He was put in the prison. What does the scripture say? Genesis 40, 1 to 4. It came to pass after these things that the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief butler and the chief baker. So he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard. This butler, this baker deserve to be in the king's prison, not Joseph, isn't it? Because they are workers in the palace. So if you offend the king, that's the prison for you, not Joseph. But look, the providence of God. So these two were brought into the prison and into an area where Joseph was placed. Prison is not small. It has so many rooms, so many departments. 
Why only bring these two prisoners to the area where Joseph was there? And when the prison guard took these men, you know where he took them? Directly to Joseph. And he said, Joseph, these two prisoners, you are in charge. You think it's a coincidence? You think it's an accident? God was working out something. So he was made in charge. Look at it, the next part. In the prison, the place where Joseph was confined, out of that huge prison, the two were led to where Joseph was. Then it says, and the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, so they were in custody for a while. For some time they were together. And you know the story, what happened? They both have a dream. One day they were sad, and uh, Joseph says, you, today you look to be so sad, what happened to you? Then they tell the dream, and Joseph says, I can tell you the meaning of the dream. And they ask him, tell us what it is. And he reveals the dream. Are you there? And he reveals the dream. The last scene, this will be the last scene I would like you to see. He reveals the dream, and then look, he says something to them. Verse Genesis 40, 14 and 15. But remember when it is well with you, and please show kindness to me, make mention of me to Pharaoh, and get me out of the house, for indeed I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews, and also I have done nothing here that they should put me in this dungeon. In other words, when he told the butler that you will be taken back to your job and the baker will be hanged, he goes to this butler and says, my friend, I revealed your dream to you. When you go back to the king, could you do me a favor, please? What is it? Please tell the king that I'm innocent and help me to get out of this place. I've been here long for things that I have never done. What would you do if you are the butler? What would you do? Here is a man who revealed a dream to you, told you in advance that your life will be sp spared. Won't you be grateful? I would, if I was that butler, sure, as soon as I'm, my, I'm taken back into my job, I will tell the king about you. Look what the scripture says. Verse 21 and 22. Then he restored the chief butler to the butlership again, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand, and he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Verse 23. Yet the chief butler, somebody read it for me, did not remember Joseph. And the last part says what? But forgot. How can you forget? Somebody who saved your life, somebody who told you a good news, how can you not remember? I, do you have dementia? We have so many people I have gone, come across in my life. When they are in need, they don't leave you. Once the need is met, they don't even want to see you. I've seen it in my life as a minister. And I wonder, how can they be like that? This man was saved. And Joseph particularly told him, look at how does this verse say? But remember, isn't it? Please remember me. How does this verse end? He forgot. He didn't remember. Completely opposite. How can it be? You think it was an accident that he forgot? You think it was a coincidence that he forgot? God purposely made this man forget for a reason that you will understand in the next one. Now, okay, this is what happened. Joseph was still in prison. Now, look at this. Then it came to pass at the end of full two years that Pharaoh had a dream. In other words, when this butler was taken back into work, from that time, another two years passed. And after those two years, that's when who had a dream? King had a dream. Then what happens? Then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh saying, I remember my faults now. You can't remember what happened yesterday, today, but you remember after two years. What's, what do you call that kind of a mindset? You see how God is working out? He says to the king, he should have remembered immediately and told the king, king, I remember. There's a man, there's a boy in the prison. Okay, let me tell you. If the butler, as soon as he was taken back to work, had remembered what Joseph told him and went to the king and said, king, thank you for showing mercy to me. I have one favor to ask you. What is it? There's a boy, innocent boy in the prison. He didn't do anything wrong. Can you please help him? What do you think the king would have done? Huh? 
Huh? I, you know, this is what I'm thinking. He would have told the butler, be happy I saved you. Yeah? Don't act smart. You want to go back to the prison again? Mind your own business. What he has to do to save Joseph, isn't it? Who is that servant boy that king have to have attention towards him? Am I right? Moreover, butler is not king's friend that he should obey his orders. But after two years, king was made vulnerable. Look at what the scripture says. After two years, he had a dream. That's when butler's memory came back. Two years after, and he says, I remember my fault, king, now. You know what? And what's your fault? Let me tell you, it's going to help you. And then what he says, when I was in a prison, there was a young Hebrew, I don't want to read. I had this dream, and the baker had this dream. We were worried. We, re we told this boy this dream. He interpreted, and it happened exactly as he said. As king was listening to the dream and its interpretation, there was hope, there was peace, he says to this butler, get that boy immediately. Had the king, had the butler told this king in the first instance about Joseph, nothing would have happened. But now the king was desperate for somebody to reveal the interpretation of the dream. And he could not wait. He says, go. You know what the people did? Immediately the soldiers went to the dungeon. They brought this boy. He was full beard. He was stinking, smelling. Man, you're going to the king's place. This is not how you go. Bible says they took him. They bathed him. They put the best clothes on him. And they brought him and put him in the presence of the king. At the age of 17, much younger than so many of you, he was sold. And now he's 30, as we said. 14 years of pain loss and suffering. Every day he was praying, Lord, you gave me a dream that you'll make me somebody, head. Now I'm a tail. I'm in dungeon. Look from where to where I have gone down. God, was, God never spoke a word with him. But yet, after 14 years of silence, he was now standing in the presence of a king. And then king says, I heard that you can interpret dreams. Can you do it for me? Look at even after 14 years of silence from God, if I was that, I would have been mad with God. Look how he responds to the king's command. You know how he says the last part? It's not me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. What? If it was me, I said, yes, I have the gift of interpretation. I can reveal your dreams. I was the one who told the butler that his life will be saved. I will do everything in my power to prove that I have the gift so that he can release me, isn't it? Humanity would have taken over me. But this boy, after 14 years of suffering, pain, and silence, he's still giving glory to God. He's saying, it's not me. How could you say? I would do everything in my power to escape and prove my credentials. And yet this boy says, not me. It's the God. Oh, I wish I have 10% of this man's faith even now as a minister of the gospel. Our churches are full of unconverted members with unconverted ministers. No wonder we are not progressing. You scratch my back and I scratch your back. This is the condition of the church. God was silent, but he was not absent in Joseph's life. Look, let's look at in Potiphar's home. Did God speak to Joseph in Potiphar's home? No. But look at what the scripture says. Genesis 39, 2 to 5. The Lord was with Joseph. And he was a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him. And the Lord made him all that he did prosper in his hand. Almost six, seven times this passage is saying, the Lord was with him. The hand of the Lord was with him. The Lord did not speak a word, but he did not forget him. Though he put him into slavery. One thing I want you to remember. If the Lord's hand to be upon you, stay faithful to the calling of God. You may not like it. I don't want to be a slave. I was a well-loved son. A son of a rich man. And now become a slave. You show me a dream that you'll make me great and put me into slavery. And yet, he chose to remain faithful. The Lord was with him. Never spoke a word, but did not leave him. You may be going through so many things. And you wonder why God is allowing me. I have come here to tell you, God may be silent, but he's with you. And next, what, what about God was silent but not absent in Joseph's life? In the prison. What about in the prison? 
look at in the prison. What does the scripture say? But the Lord was with Joseph and he showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And how it has went? Because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. Even in the prison, God never showed up, but yet he was with him. He was silent, but he was not absent. When did Joseph understand God's silence? When did God, Joseph understand God was God's silent? Look at Genesis 41, 46 to 48. And Joseph was how many years old? 30 years old when he stood before king. By then it was 14 years. God never spoke to him a word, either by dream or by a voice, isn't it? So that 14 years passed. And then what happens? After the dream and interpretation, the king says, who is better than you, Joseph? Take over in charge and, you know, be the a ruler. Then it says there was seven years of plentiful. 14 years plus seven is how much? Hello? 21, good. I thought this college doesn't have mathematics department, okay. 21 years, yeah? But look at next, look at the next slide. But now, do not therefore be grieved of angry with yourselves because you said, uh, you said, sold me here. But God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years, the famine has been in the land. Now tell me, how many years? 14 years of silence? And then seven years of plentiful. And then after two years into famine, that's when his brothers came to buy food. So how many years is it? Huh? 23 years. What happened at the end of... What, what did Joseph come to know after 23 years? What did Joseph come to know after 23 years? Verse 7. Somebody read for me. Verse 7. And God sent me before you in to preserve a posterity for you in the earth. In other words, after 23 years, Joseph understood why God allowed him to go through all these things. When he saw his brothers, he now understood God has allowed this to happen to make him preserve his own family. God could have done it without this 23 years of waste of time, isn't it? And yet... God was preparing Joseph for something that he could not even think of. 23 years it took him and to make. So what did he understand at the end of 23 years? He told his brothers what? You meant it evil for me, but God meant it good. He understood that after 23 years. God was silent for 23 years, 14 years in the beginning. Nine years later, that's when his mind was opened to say, wow, is this the reason God allowed these things to happen? Had Joseph faltered in between, the course of history would have been different, isn't it? Had he fallen into the, uh, uh, the seducing of that woman, I don't know what Joseph's story would have been. While God was silent, you are to remain faithful. Don't forget that. Don't find shortcuts to help God like Abraham. Oh, I'm old now. God is not giving me a child. Let me find my way of getting a child. He messed up. So in all this, people in the life of Joseph, people in the life of Joseph, while God was silent, you may be going through pain. Look at people maybe like Joseph. What about Joseph's brothers? God was using them for his own purposes. His own brothers were against him. What about Midianite traders? You think they were interested in the boy? No, they were interested in getting some gain. So you, there may be people in your pathway, your own family, your own brothers and sisters who may be against you. There may be traders like the Midianites who are interested in you just to get some money out of you. There may be people in your life like Potipha. He saw this young boy, he said he could be a better slave and he bought him. God was using all these people. Potiphar's wife looked at his handsome and she wanted to sleep with him. She has her own agenda. King's prisoners, they had their own agenda to tell the dream and get something. And Pharaoh himself, why did he make him a ruler? Because he helped him in a certain way. God was using, now this is what I want you to hear. What they could not see is that they were all unwittingly accomplishing the purposes of a sovereign God. In your pathway, you may come across people who are mean to you, who are cruel to you, who will put you down, who will abuse you, who will accuse you, who will do all sorts of things that you don't want to be done. But if you remain faithful to God, 
God will use all those circumstances for your own advantage. That's what Joseph's story is teaching me. Leave them alone. The Lord will take care of them. Vengeance belongs to God, he says, isn't it? God in his own time. You stay faithful like Joseph. You will have what God may be silent, but he's not absent. Look at this. Joseph might have been a slave, but he was under the banner of a divine providence. You may be going through the pain, whatever it may be. Remember, the hand of the Lord is on you. Joseph, he might have been separated from his earthly father, but his heavenly father went with him and before him in Egypt. You heard my story yesterday. I lost my father one month, but my heavenly father never left me. If my father was alive, I don't even think I would have got an education. God knew what to do for his faithful children. Sometimes he has to take away something to give you something better. Stay faithful to him. While the events of Joseph's life appeared to be out of control, isn't it? Look at how low he has gone. Everything was out of control. He had not even 1% of control of his life. You know what's the meaning of a slave? You don't have a mind of your own. You're not a servant. You're a slave. You're controlled everything by somebody else. That's the kind of life. Everything seems to go out of control, but they were actually being controlled by God. Have you seen that? From the pit to everything God was controlling. While Joseph was thinking, everything is going out of control. God was in control. God was with Joseph, protecting, preserving, and preparing him for something good. But in the school of suffering. Sometimes we may have to go through that. School, quickly. God's silence in the life of Jesus. Okay, even Jesus. You know, God was close to his son Jesus. When at the baptism, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And at the transfiguration, again Jesus spoke, isn't it? That's my beloved son. So whenever God, God was boasting about his son, that's my beloved son. But when Jesus needed the most, his father's help, God chose to be silent. Where was God when Jesus was being persecuted? Isn't it? Even in the garden of Gethsemane, where was God? When he was beaten, when he was ridiculed, when he was mocked, when he was spat upon, that's when Jesus, God should have come and said, that's my son. But God, God, God kept quiet. Where was God when he was being crucified? Look at what Ellen White says in Desire of Ages. The enemies of Jesus vented their rage upon him as he hung upon the cross. Priests, rulers, scribes joined with the mob in mocking the dying Savior. And the baptism at the transfiguration, the voice of God had been proclaimed, Christ as his son. Again, just before Christ's betrayal, the Father had spoken, witnessing to his divinity. But now, the voice from heaven was silent. No testimony in Christ's favor was heard. Alone he suffered abuse and mockery from the wicked men. When he needed the most of his father's presence, that's when God chose to be quiet. Another statement, salvation, it says, look at Elmer, it says, the withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in the hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with sorrow. In other words, on the cross, what pained Jesus the most is not the physical pain, but the pain of his father being quiet to an extent. You know what Jesus himself said? My father, my father, why have you forsaken? Can you imagine what would have happened in the mind of Jesus for him to say that his father forget, forgot him? In fact, he says, you have forsaken me. From morning nine till evening three, six hours on the cross, not a word from his father. Son, I am with you. Stay faithful. No. His disciples deserted him. People were mocking him. Look up to heaven. Father was quiet. The son said, father... Why have you forsaken me? When I needed you the most, that's when you choose to be quiet. Why do you think God was quiet when he was needed the most by his son? Paul explains. That is, why was God quiet? God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Amen. All of you parents, like me, if your son or a daughter is suffering, I'm telling you my experience. I suffer the most. When I see my daughter with a hot temperature and struggling to breathe and struggling to eat and not able to get her from the bed, I feel more pain. I had times when I prayed, Lord, give that sickness to me, not to my daughter. I can't see her suffer. You know who suffered the most on the cross? The father. 
but he chose to be quiet for you and for me. If it was me, I don't care. Brother MK, you're not important to me. My daughter is important. I will do anything and everything in my power to save my daughter, not you. But God chose to be quiet, not because he didn't love his son, but he loved you more than his son. So he made his son suffer for you in silence. To an extent where his son on the cross said, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? Paul says, God was in Christ reconciling the world himself. Had God intervened, looked at the pain of his son, all the things, and he said, you know what, I can't take it anymore. Whether Whatever happens, my son is more important to me. And had gone and rescued his son, what could have happened? There's no gospel. There's no salvation. There is no hope for humanity. Praise God, he was silent. Because that silence brought hope and salvation to you and for me. Are you experiencing God's silence in your life? God's promise in your experience of silence is when you go through the waters, when you pass through the waters, I am with you. When you go through the rivers, I am with you. When you go through the fire, I am still with you. God did not say, I will, I will part the sea, I will remove the water, I will quench the, uh, I will put off the fire. Did he say that? No. You may have to go through them, but one thing I want you to know, I am with you. My dear boys and girls and believers in Christ, if you're experiencing God's silence in one way or the other in your life, I have come here to tell you, God may be silent, but he is not absent. Like Joseph, like Jesus, stay faithful to him. At the right time, it was 23 years for Joseph, whatever the time for Jesus, I don't know whatever time for you and me, stay faithful at the right time. He will show you he was never absent in your life. God bless you.